everyone, it's Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide here, and it is wonderful to be back after a bit of a summer break. And uh, in a moment, I'll be introducing you to our very special guest on today's Tudor Talk, and that is Jeremy Asprey from English Heritage. But before we come to that, just to say, of course, that the subject of today's live chat is all about the Tower of London. Now, gosh, the Tower of London has to be one of the most popular destinations on any uh, Tudor lovers travel itinerary. So I hope you are, can come along and you've got some questions that you can put uh, to Jeremy and, Jeremy and I'd be delighted to put those to him for you. So. In the meantime, I can see that we have a few people joining. So as ever, if you can hear me okay and you can see me okay, make sure you give the thumbs up or heart and drop a comment in the chat, the live chat here, of course. You can chat to me uh, as we go along. First of all, maybe you could just introduce yourself, say hello and tell me wherever you are in the world. And maybe you could tell me if you've been to the Tower of London before, that would be cool too. So yeah, I've got some people coming through. So here we go. So Cindy is in the house. Okay, hi Cindy, love to see you. Lovely to see you. And Catherine, hi Sarah, Catherine is back in. It's so good to see you. Um, have you been having a good summer folks? Have any of you been out and about? Have you been traveling? Has Covid got the best of you? Have you been in still in lockdown? I know all over the world things are very different for people. Um, so yeah, just let me know. So who else? We've got we've got Cynthia. Hi Cynthia, you're camping in North Florida. That sounds lovely. So is um is that a camper van? Is that a tent? What are you doing there? And is that usual for you? That'd be lovely to know. And um, hello, Robin. Hi, lovely to see you. Thanks for dropping by. And um, and Catherine, you're saying, um, was a member of Historic Royal Palaces, the Tower was a real favourite to visit. So yeah, um, I think it's a favourite for many people. It's so steeped in Tudor history, isn't it? Um, so much drama that went on there. Okay, so as I go, all I want to say is do keep um, posting your questions. You can uh, post your thoughts, or if you have any specific questions, just make sure you drop them in the live chat. I'll be keeping half an eye out on that live chat and making sure that I put your questions to Jeremy as we go. Now, as ever, um, we've done a little bit of a technical check here. We're hoping the sound and everything is okay for you guys. Uh, let me know if you are having any difficulties. And just got a few more people joining us. We've got Stan, hi. Thanks for your great work. Well, thank you very much, Stan, for joining us. That's wonderful. And Gillian, lovely to see you again, Gillian from Milton Keynes. Is it nice and sunny there in Milton Keynes today? Okay, so I think we've got a few people joined now. So I think without further ado, we should press on. And with that, I would like to introduce today's very special guest on Tudor Talk. So um, here we go. So can I introduce you to Jeremy? Hi, Jeremy, you're live on Tudor Talk. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you. That's great. Now, Jeremy, you and I met, didn't we, in February. We had a lovely morning. I think it was gloriously crisp and sunny, cold morning at Elton Palace. And we were recording a podcast and we were blissfully unaware that COVID was about to strike us down. Yeah, we were having too good a time, very clearly. And the, the, there was something in destiny that said, OK, we're going to come up behind you and hit you with the lead piping because it was just the most perfect day. As you remember, the sun was shining. There was frost on the ground. The, the buildings just looked fantastic, apart from the fact that there was someone with a chainsaw that was uh, that was was doing a preparation for filming for, for an advert, as far as I remember. And uh, 
so actually recording was was kind of fun but we we got there so so th i'm really glad that the experience uh, was as good for you as it was for me but you've had me back on for this one. Oh yes do you know it's funny wherever i go there seems to be machinery or drilling or sawing wherever i go so anyway i'm, I'm kind of used to that now but yeah no it's lovely uh, we spoke about you coming here on tudor talk because um, well, I'm going to let you introduce yourself in a moment, but just suffice to say that you are head property curator at English Heritage. So, wow, what a job. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what that means? Yeah, I can. I mean, it's uh, the, the titles are always a little bit weird, but I, um, I've worked at English Heritage since 2003. And basically what we always say is if it could fall down, I'm in charge of it. If it could be stolen... Uh, one of my good friends, uh, the, the the head collections curator, sort of has responsibility. But no, I mean, I have the very lucky job of um, working with some incredibly talented teams of people. One team that does research about the buildings for the sake of looking after them. Uh, and then there's another team that we call the historians, some of whom are historians, some of whom are archaeologists, who have the, 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 the absolutely lovely job, um, I hope they think so too, of working out what stories we tell to the visiting public and then we tell them. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you see some uh, interpretation material on a site or you look at the English Heritage website or you read a guidebook or, or something else of that kind, chances are it'll be one of my guys that, that do it. Um, I mean, I, what I always say is I'm, I'm blessed with having incredibly uh, able people as a consequence of which I'm not quite sure what it is that I exist to do anymore because they could do it so much better without me but anyway here I, I am. Think that's, I think that's you know I, I think you know you're in a great job when you're surrounded by people who make you feel like that about what you do so um, so yeah well you must have how many properties then does English you know, Heritage look after that you're responsible for? Well we've got 420 and they start with Kit Scotty House, actually very near where I'm speaking to you from now. Actually, I'm in Rochester in Kent, and Kit Scotty is a is a is a prehistoric Neolithic burial chamber on the North Downs, and they end with the 1960s Cold War bunker in a back garden in York. So we 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 reckon that um, we've got you know the best um, the best material for for understanding the history of England anywhere. You know, I mean, we are we are like 420 museums sort of added up and the properties are fantastic they, they they tell so many stories we'd love to have more and actually tell a more diverse uh, set of stories as well but maybe that's that that's a whole other question wow. but so yeah I I, I mean I, I I do pinch myself sometimes that I I have a job I get paid to to, to do which which I would I quite frankly you know many people would give their eye teeth to but yes indeed yeah, absolutely you're very lucky and out of all of those properties of course we're here to talk today about one which I know is your fa one of your favorites if not your definite favorite and that's the Tower of London so well I've got loads of favorites Sarah <laughs> but the Tower of London I should explain um the Tower of London this is this is the place where I learned it all and English Heritage my present organization doesn't run the Tower of London it belongs to historic royal palaces and they uh, they hired me uh, when I was a, a young, um, uh, growing archaeologist, uh, come down uh, from uh, Lancashire to, to London to seek my fortune, um, to go and be one of their historic buildings team. And the other one, uh, the, the other uh, person that joined at the same time was Jonathan Foyle, who I happen to know you, you've got uh, coming on a future live. So mm -hmm. say hi from me. We, 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 we should. I'll, I'll give him a call. But mm. I um, got the job at the London property. So I was I was the, the looking after the buildings of uh, Kensington Palace, the banqueting house at Whitehall and the Tower of London and the Tower of London rapidly. Uh, you know, became apparent that I could go many lifetimes and I would only just have scratched the surface. So it's uh, it, it's one of those places that, that can occupy your, your every waking thought. It was just the most brilliant place to, to work. And, you know, as you say, it's so steeped in history of all periods. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking today about the Tudors. And, I, I you know, it's it's been lovely to have the opportunity to, to go back again and have a look at at, at, at some of the things that I worked on, you know, a few years ago now, um, and you know, I'd be interested to, to to hear from 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 everyone who's 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 listening to this call wh wh whether it all still stacks up or 
or whether whether or not there's the, the, there's more stuff that, that that needs to be done. So I'm just going to pause for a moment because I'm just noticing on the chat that that for some reason and I really don't know why I think the live chat is freezing for people. Okay. Um, so, um, however, I think the best that we can do. I'm really sorry, guys. I've no idea why that's going on. It's showing us all okay here. Maybe there's just a bit of a glitch in the internet briefly, but we're going to carry on because whatever happens, this will be on YouTube and you will be able to uh, watch it after the event if you are struggling to watch it live. Oh, and we're back. Excellent. I'm just saying, folks, that I'm sorry if this, I can see there's some issues with things freezing. I don't know what that's about. We're going to keep going and you will be able to watch this um, on YouTube after the event. It will be there. In perpetuity. So um, let's keep going. Okay, so let's then dive in to, um, to, to talk a little bit about the tower. Um, now, let's start with how people see the tower today, because it, it is, as I say, one of those just incredibly iconic buildings. And I think particularly if you're interested in Tudor history, you tend to get involved with its more gruesome side. Um, but of course, the tower was built for so much more than that maybe you can talk to us about you know the range of uses of the tower and, and what kind of modern uh, media has done to uh, to shape our impressions of it yeah thanks sarah i mean it, this is the perfect way into it um and when i started at the tower in 1996 i mean i i, I got a number of conflicting viewpoints first of all one of my friends said you know, what the hell, why are they employing anyone at the Tower of London? Surely it's so famous that everything is known. And that turned out not to be right. Um, I, I had another friend who, who said something, and I'd be really interested if people think this is about right. He said, well, you know, if you're going to present it to the public, obviously you should make it look like it looked on the day when Anne Boleyn was beheaded. That's sort of, you know, that is the day when the Tower of London was sort of, you know, okay. you know, on its own. And, and you know, who knows? That, that, that That's a view that I dare say I... I, I Suffice to say, we couldn't do it, but that's that's a viewpoint that I'm sure many have. But then on the on the other end, as, as I started to get into it, we 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 had the view of of um, some medieval historians, particularly, who felt that the, uh, the 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 sinister legend actually is a bit of uh, is a bit of myth making, and that and, and that, that that it's it's a debasement of history to imagine, as they, as as he put it the place was built by Henry VIII for the sole purpose of incarcerating, racking and finally beheading his opponents. Um, and of course, it wasn't built by Henry VIII. It had already been existed for a long time. And Henry VIII did much, much more with it. I think the key to it is exactly as you say, the range of things that happened there are, uh, uh, you know, are very broad. But it's not for nothing that the prison and the place of execution have come to the fore because, as I think you alluded to this at the beginning, and many writers have, have, have picked up on this, the human story is enormous. And the stories of people suffering and, and you know, eventually sometimes play, play, playing the ultimate price. Um, it's not for nothing that these things have, have actually lasted through the centuries when, when other, other functions have been forgotten. So that was a long writing thing to say. But Henry VIII, yes, it was a, it was a prison. He would have known it, but he also would have known it as a palace. It's the place where, uh, you know, some of the high points of his reign for, for him and for other people actually take place. That shouldn't be forgotten. And it remained a royal palace. In fact, it's technically still a royal palace. It is called Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth's Palace and Fortress, the Tower of London. Is that so? It, I didn't, I it, didn't it, know Yeah, it's, it's, I didn't it still know. is. Um, the, it's, I mean, we never call it. London Castle, but actually that's really what it is. And the, the fact that it was a very strong building with, 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 with big defences, it was armed sometimes to the teeth, sometimes not, but it, you know, the, the, there was supposed to be uh, very impressive stores of war and actually for, for uh, you know, for, for the use for the, for the defence of the tower. It has a role in, in commanding London, and that's that's always been a, a very important part of its history right up until the 20th century. Um, and then it has a whole lot of other really small things, some of which are, are, are quite well known and some of which aren't. The Royal Menagerie, certainly in Henry's time, the King's Beasts, the, the, the Lions, they were the first thing you saw as you entered the Tower of London. Um, the Royal Mint was the second thing you saw in the Tower of London because much of the outer ward was there. It's the only place of coinage um, at all time. And 
you know, other things, the record office, it was the place where all the all the documents were kept, the embryonic um, National Archives or Public Record Office was actually at the Tower of London. And later on, it even had things like the, the Royal Observatory was, was briefly there. So just to, re to reduce the whole thing to being this, this, this hideous prison actually is, is, is to do something of a, of a disservice to, to something that to onlookers in the 16th century, it, 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 you know, everyone must have realised that it was a bit more diverse than just that. Yeah, yeah. So it was built primarily, uh, was it built by William the Conqueror, is that right? And to defend London and then it developed these multifaceted uses over time by the monarchy. Yeah, well, yeah, d d defend London gets us into some interesting territory and I would probably put it a different way. So they're actually to keep London, you know, you know, beneath the king's heel a little bit. And I think that's the important thing because actually my own researches were, were primarily about the Middle Ages. I wrote a doctorate um, during my time at the Tower of London and partly after when I came over to English Heritage. And, and you know, to, to get that out the way quickly, what I found is that in the Middle Ages, it was the same as it was under the Tudors. It was, it still had, it already had a fairly sinister reputation. All of the functions that I just ran through were were, were happening there already. Mm. Um, but the big thing was it was never a popular place. That People always realised that some of its purpose was coercive. And, mm. and once you sort of realise that, you know, for every state, there are some functions that they need to do in public. And, you know, for Henry VIII, Hampton Court is a good stage for that. There are other things that you need to do to keep things running that you don't necessarily need everyone to see. And by and large, those are the things that happened at the Tower of London, looking after stuff, keeping people that you don't like, disciplining a big and potentially unruly city. And some of the, the sort of more industrial processing, making the coins work, making the armor, making the, the weapons of war and all of those things. And once you realize that actually the Tower of London was this big fortress where these things could happen securely. Suddenly everything starts to make a bit of sense, including the prison uh, and how it related to it, to everything else. Right, so we've got a couple of questions coming through. I'm going to actually, I'm going to acknowledge them and just read them, but I, I actually want to come back to them because obviously this is about Tudor talk, so we're going to be right. focusing <clears throat> in on that. But uh, Robin wants to know um, to what degree you believe Anne Boleyn is buried under the altar of the Tower Chapel. So I really want to come back to that and the burials um, in the chapel at the tower. And, um, and and Gillian's asking, and maybe we could dive into this a little bit sooner. Who do you think truly murdered the little princes in the tower? So that's a, that, that might be your opinion about something. Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll come back to those. So if we can think of princes in the tower and Anne Boleyn, yep. we'll, we'll come back Got to them. those. Okay. But I, before we get into that, I'd really love you to paint a picture of how the tower looked. And I mean, you've talked about its multifaceted uses, but how did it look during the Tudor period? And I'm one of the places, parts of the tower that I'm always drawn to are the royal apartments, which, of course, are gone now. So I think when I first started going to the tower before I completely lost myself in the Tudors, I had no idea that there was this beautiful range of royal apartments um and and maybe quite a few people miss that so yeah can i hand you that question and see yeah you can of okay first of all slide. the most iconic bit of the tower of london is the is the white tower that the, the the keep in the middle of the tower of london and everyone i hope if you just take a second to, to conjure up the image of that in your mind at the top of the white tower there are four turrets and those turrets have got what someone once described as pepper pot domes and i can never get any better than that they are this sort of rather strange onion shaped dome thing mm. That was built by Henry VIII. The, those pepper pot domes go on and they've stayed ever since. There's good 1532 timber underneath all of them. Ah, right. 1532 is a good moment to think about. I mean, you ask what it looked like in the Tudor time. And all I'd say is that the Tudor period is quite long. It goes on for more than a century. Yeah. But that particular moment in the 1530s is really interesting. And we know a hell of a lot about it because of the famous or infamous Thomas Cromwell needing to when he was the king's man of business, needing to get the place sorted out. It had obviously been allowed to, to, to physically de deteriorate a bit. And it needed to look good because they were about to have a coronation, the coronation of Anne Boleyn, which is going to take place in the 1530s, in 1533. Anne Boleyn was going to have to stay in some apartments. The old medieval royal lodgings, which had been around since the 13th century, uh, some of them looked like they'd been around since the 13th century. They really did not look any good. And 
all along the riverside frontage where there was the great hall there were chambers at either end and then running from one of the one of the towers on the river frontage the lanthorn tower running north up the hill towards the white tower there was another range of apartments now the range that, that unfortunately as you say for a couple of good historical reasons they just don't really survive anymore um, largely because of fire the great fire of london in 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 1666 didn't damage the tower of london as a mercy but it did make everyone terrified of fire so a number of Anne Boleyn's apartments were knocked down shortly after the great fire in order to actually clear an area around the white tower which was full of gunpowder and they really wanted to make sure that that there was a cordon sanitaire around it so that goes and a road is put through the middle of the fortress between one storehouse and another um, the stuff along the river frontage probably would have done OK, but they have another fire in 1774 and they decided after that they were going to knock it all down um, and would build an enormous um, office and storehouses for the ordnance. These are the people that, that run the, the weapons of war. A building so hideous that someone in the 19th century said, you know, it has all the charm of one of the great gin palaces of London. It was enormously tall, but it had very deep foundations. And as an archaeologist, I've always I always, you know, went with the idea that we could dig up the royal apartments and find the plan. No, nothing survives. Unfortunately, it's gone. So there is this hole in the middle of the fortress where there was a quite glittering and rather interesting labyrinthine royal palace where all of these events, these dramatic events actually took place. It, it, it is a terrible loss. Oh. And I've often thought if I had, you know, the, the, if I had time travel, there's lots of things I'd love to see. But just yeah. half an hour walking through the, the apartments of the Tower of London, I've, you know, the, the good thing is there are a lot. The Tower of London is famous and it's well documented. So I talked about Thomas Cromwell doing up or, you know, organizing all these repair works in 1532. And he's a great record keeper and so are others. So there's a load of documents that say, you know, to put in a new timber roof and frame for the Queen's dining chamber with the jakes at the northern end and two uh, bay windows on the east side and another bay window on the western side and a stair leading up into it on the south side. Once you've got a whole load of these things, you can start to reconstruct mm. it in your mind's eye and on paper. Mm. And a number of historians have done that. So it's not all doom and gloom. No. But it, there just isn't the stuff to see there when you go now. But I would point out to anybody listening that um, I'm sure it's historic royal palaces have done a recreation of the apartments and it's on YouTube. And if you search for, um, I think it's the Anne Boleyn's apartments or it's an amazing sort of um, digital, isn't it, reconstruction, which is as close yes. as we're going to get. <laughs> um, but I remember finding that for the first time and be like, what? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's ironic, really, that some of the older bits, you know, I mean, the White Tower is a building of the 11th century, it's built for William the Conqueror, that survived with changes, but it survived relatively well. There's some buildings for Henry III and Edward I in the 13th century, but the Tudor stuff, um, there are certainly, I mean, you know, I talked about the the the, do the, 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 the cupolas. Um, another building at another, on the other side of the Tower of London from the Royal Apartments is what's called the Queen's House. And that's actually Queen Elizabeth the II's house, if she ever wanted to use her palace in the Tower of London, that's where she'd live. But uh, being a lady, she doesn't want to do that. So that's now where her representatives, the resident governor and sometimes the constable of the tower live. And that's a timber frame building of the 1540s. It's built for the Lieutenant Sir Edward Walsingham. So it's just too late for Anne Boleyn. Yeah. But, you know, how, how wonderful that is, a timber frame building in London that wasn't lost at the Great Fire. Well, that's the, true, yeah. The building that we often call Traitor's Gate, and I ought to come back to that name a little bit later on, the building that's, that's more officially known as St. Thomas's Tower. Actually, behind the medieval frontage, the interior of that building is a Tudor structure. It's a Tudor timber frame, again, built uh, this time in the 1530s by James Needham, the King's Master Carpenter. And again, it's, it's a beautiful piece of carpentry that was fitted up actually as the apartments of two of Anne Boleyn's courtiers over the Traitor's Gate for her coronation. Um, so, that, you know, that there's actually once you add it up, there's quite a lot, but yeah. it just isn't the royal apartments, the bit that probably we all most want to see because it's the one where so much of the really good stuff happened. Yes, 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 yes. And there's also there's the jewel house, wasn't there, which I'm always I love, you know, fascinated in. When did that when did we lose the jewel house at the same time? So this was where was this where the medieval kings kept their, you know, the, the crown jewels, etc. and all their plate and wealth? 
Well, the crown jewels, OK, no, they move around a bit. Many of the times they're not at the Tower of London. When they are at the Tower of London, they tend to be kept in, in a whole variety of locations. Sometimes they're in the White Tower, sometimes they're in some, some other towers. But the jewel house of the Tudors mm -hmm. wasn't a medieval structure. It's actually built by Thomas Cromwell in the 1530s oh, okay. against the south face of the White Tower. So it's the same area where the palace yeah. is. It actually must have been full of buildings and really quite. I mean, now it's this broad, expansive open mm -hmm. lawn with ravens hopping about on it. <laughs> it was full of buildings. Um, tragically, that goes in the um, again after the Great Fire, it goes in the 1660s. And um, you, you, the, the, the listener, the, the viewer that asked the question about the princes in the town might enjoy the fact that it was while clearing out the Jewel Tower and all the other um, structures against the south face of the White Tower that um, workmen discovered uh, two sets of bones under a stair that purport that 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 were thought to be the bones of the princes in the tower. They were found in the in, in, in the 1660s and moved over to Westminster Abbey, and that's where they've they've rested ever since. So it's a this is a good reminder for anyone that didn't know that all periods of history are interrelated. You can't talk about the Tudors without talking. Here I'll go. I've talked about Henry VIII. I've talked about Edward the First. I've talked about Charles the Second. Um, and later on, when we get to Anne Boleyn, we'll talk about the Victorians because Queen Victoria is 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 actually has an important off um, off stage role in, in in this saga. So maybe we should talk a little bit about Anne Boleyn, and um, yes. before we get to the the sad and tragic events of 1536, you mentioned her coronation, and can you? I know there was a huge coronation procession that kind of got lined up for her. Can you try and paint a little bit about that? day and you know yeah the I can ceremony that went on and uh, etc in the tower I can and this is another nice example of the fact that the Tudors invent relatively little that you know much of the day that Anne Boleyn experienced was a day that her medieval predecessors would also have had and the big thing is if you're going to Westminster to be crowned if at all possible you should stay at the Tower of London beforehand why so that you can process at the head of an enormous army with all the nobility and knighthood through the city from the east end the tower of london to westminster which of course is a separate village in those days mm -hmm. off, off towards the west end you get to show yourselves to all the londoners and they get to do pageants for you and to, to you know to to shout god save the queen and all that lot and even before you get to to go on this procession you do this strange ritual which is it takes about a day and a half to do called the ritual of making knights of the bath and this happened for henry the eighth at his coronation it happened for anne it happened to, to various others in which the most up-and-coming young men so sir francis weston he's going to come back in this story too he's among them and about 25 others get to be initiated into the order of knighthood by this ritual the knights of the bath which at the center of which involves going into the white tower the oldest bit um of the um of the fortress built by, by as i say by by um william the conqueror and a desperately uncomfortable and dark and miserable building in which baths would be set up in a line in one of the big chambers and the knight would get his kit off would go and sit in the bath and be instructed into the duties of knighthood to be you know to to relieve oppressed maidens to be uh, supportive of the Holy Church to honour thy, thy sovereign Lord, the King above all things, while some other numpty is is, is splashing water over you, and it's it's a bit like a baptism if you mm -hmm. like. And then after you get out, you then get dressed up in very plain um, uh, vestments like a hermit, and you have to kneel in vigil all night in the chapel. And then you get to go, you put on your finery, including spurs. You get to go to a banquet in the, the Great Hall of the Tower of London, uh, which you are, by the way, not allowed to eat. You just have to stand there um, oh, really? looking like a bit of a lemon while other people do it. And, I, you know, an anthropologist could have great fun with this, that you get your status by basically being humble, by, 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 by showing that you are, you know, not going to get too uppity and you will stick to the rules. You, you get to be inducted into the Order of Knighthood and then you get to go and ride with Anne um, in this big procession through London. Of course, you know, she's expecting at the time. So it's a bit of an ordeal for her, but she she goes through with it. And, you know, it must be that, that you know, the high point, if you like, of her of her fortunes. You know, they've been so long. This has been so long coming. Henry has wanted it so much. And 
you know she she plays the game you know very 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 cleverly and and this day comes and it's a glittering day and the tower of london smells of fresh paint you know everything has been you know got in its place the gardens have got ornamental bridges and king's beasts and veins on you know, all this kind of stuff it, it really does look wonderful and the ordnance go bang you know and and the trumpeters play and and all that as the yeoman warders in their tour then do not very long afterwards Anne would come back but under very different circumstances and then they pause you know, yes, quite a yes, lot yes. that's you know where the story comes but crucially it's the same tower of london and it's the same bits of the tower of london that get involved yeah. famously as she comes into the to the fortress constable sir william kingston meets uh, her and she says am i to go to some dungeon and he says no madam you go to the chambers where at your grace lay before your coronation the place that had been associated with the the, the height of her fortunes is now going to play a part in the in in in, 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 in the, the last grisly days of her downfall so we've definitely got questions coming about um, maybe your opinions on different things and um so Maybe I'll just, since we've got on to talking about Anne's story and Anne being accused as she was of all sorts of different things, um, just to ask your opinion about a couple of things. So I'm just going to drag over Stan. Oh, will that come up? Yes. Yeah. So how justified were the accusations of Anne Boleyn of adultery or was it just an attempt of Thomas Cromwell to please his master? What do you think on that? Well, I think, I, I, mean, I am not an expert, so I don't know, but I... I, I... I, I don't read too many people that, that think that there's any truth in it at all. I mean, I think, you know, Anne, um, you know, hers is a hers is a story that, that where, where you can see that, that, that she had offended many people and that it, that it was in various people's interest to get rid of her. But it's uh, it, it sounds so lurid that I've never really given any 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 great credence to it. I would I would imagine that's a view that, that you would mm -hmm. share, Sarah, but that oh. also that yes. many others you know, I, I think I think basically it. I think most people think that that is you know it was uh, a, a trumped up charges conspired by Cromwell when his back was a bit against the wall really um, it was a very very clever bit of um, political uh, shenanigans on his part and he um, he pulled it off rather well unfortunately I mean I've, I've never checked this but the, the the version that always goes out that it really was a stitch up job that the the, the, the the executioner from Calais was on his way before mm. the verdict was in for the trial. I mean, that you know, if that's true, and I, 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 I I've always believed that it was. Mm. Um, isn't that rather telling? Yes, yeah. I think it probably is. I think it probably is. Um, I'm. We, we are definitely going to come back to the Amberlynn story, but I also just wanted to ask another couple of questions. So, Catherine, I'm going to drag your question over here. Um, Catherine said, are visitors allowed to view the medieval wall painting of St. Michael that was discovered under the lime wash in the Byward Tower? I think it, it is where staff live, so likely private. What yeah, um, well, I don't think there's, there's no one. OK, yes, it's, it's a good question. Um, the answer is, you. I think you have to make prior arrangement with the authorities of the Tower of London and they will find someone to take you in because they certainly keep the room clear and there's a last time I went in um, was earlier this uh, was 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 late last calendar year and they have this this very nice uh, carpet which protects the medieval floor tiles underneath which is photographically printed to look like the medieval floor tiles oh. but it's springing underfoot so you're not doing any damage <laughs> um, yeah I mean anyone who's never heard of this is it's not Tudor um, it is simply one of the most beautiful things that I know of in this country anyone who knows the um, the the painting the panel painting in the National Gallery the Wilton diptych it's in that style. It's the style of the late 14th century. And it's the remains of a wall painting, um, almost certainly of a, of a crucifixion, um, where the, 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 there are four fragmentary saints, uh, St. John the Baptist, the Virgin Mary, St. John the Evangelist, and St. Michael, the Archangel, weighing the souls of the Last Judgment. What we've lost is the bit in the middle, and it's almost certainly a crucifixion. Um, why have we lost the bit in the middle? Well, thank you, the Tudors. There's, there's something that I'm not very pleased with the Tudors oh. about. Doubtless not knowing that this wall painting was there, they shoved uh, a brick fireplace through the middle and painted a Tudor rose on top of it. Oh, so the central icon has gone. But it is a very beautiful thing. My theory, and um, that one of the curators of the Tower, Jane Spooner, took it a lot further than I ever got to, was that it was connected with the Royal Mint because the business about weighing things in the balance, weighing souls, weighing gold coins, this is all part of their business. And um, 
and certainly it's in the part of the Tower of London where where the Royal Mint administrators were based. So I, I think that that's what it's about. Um, yeah, anyway, you know, anyone who who who, who can make contact uh, with the authorities before visiting the tower would be well advised to do it because it is a lovely thing. Well, that's great. Who who? I mean, I know there are going to be people thinking, who do I contact exactly? <laughs> so- well, that I really that I really really don't know. I mean, because uh, I, something that I hope we would come back to to uh, you know towards the end. I mean, the Tower of London is not having a wonderful time of it at the moment because because of the COVID nineteen situation and international tourism. So. Um, one of the reasons why I really, really wanted to do this, to raise its profile a bit, is because I know that the present curators at the Tower, some of them are, are, are on furlough and not available. Otherwise, it would be them that would that would that would show one. But I think there is on the Historical Palaces website, I think there are general contact uh, details for the Tower of London. And I'd advise you to, to, to have a go with that. That's probably the best way. OK. All right. So, again, I'm just going to a couple of other comments. The moat. Talk to us about a moat because there's. There's obviously the dry moat now. What would we have seen if we'd have been there in the Tudor period and from, from an external view of the of the tower? Yeah, OK, you'd have seen... Uh, you, well, you'd have smelt it before you saw it, I suspect. Um, <laughs> really? What you would have seen is uh, a very ragged-edged um, body of water that at certain times of the day would probably run dry. Um, the moat had been a feature of the Tower of London certainly since the 13th century, and... The Tower of London basically reaches its final extent in the reign of Edward the First at the end of the 13th century, and he had a he had a moat. His predecessors had also had a moat, but he had a moat. And Henry VIII, it was certainly still there um, in his time, and it was there during uh, the, for the rest of the Tudor period. Rather lovely. There, some of you may know there's there's a quite early uh, plan of the Tower of London made in the year 1597 by uh, two draftsmen called Hayward and Gascoigne and it accompanies a report made in 1597 for the lieutenant of the tower Sir John Payton one of the things Sir John Payton says is the water in the moat keeps running dry and it's horrible because all the latrines of London and of the tower are are pouring into it and it's really uh, really bad for health Mm. that situation never got any better it was supposed to be sort of cleansed twice a day by the tidal action of the Thames and it never did because it basically is designed as an oxbow lake and the the main water course of the Thames never really penetrated into it. Eventually, in the 1830s, the Duke of Wellington, the constable of the Tower of London, said, "Look, I've I've, I've had enough of this. The the soldiers are are, 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 di- are, are really sickly, and we're just going to fill it in." So they 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 dug it out. They they set, took some of the uh, soil off to Battersea for the market gardeners there. Uh, so there's probably nice some interesting archaeology in Battersea where bits of the Tower of London keep oh, okay. turning up. But the rest of the time it's filled in. And when I first came to the Tower in 1996, on the cards was the question of whether the moat could be recreated. Um, I think, you know, it's an idea that people still keep coming back to, but it would have cost many, many millions. It's very, very hard to engineer. It would have been there. Um, it would have been a quite unpleasant you know, thing. For much of the time but certainly it was a feature of, of the tudor tower right okay and um we've got another question this might you may have already answered this jeremy i'm not quite sure but daniel's asking do you know anything of the demolition in the later 19th century of the much altered queen's wardrobe beside the white tower yeah, a little bit. If it was the queen's wardrobe, and that's a that's a difficult question because, as I say, the the um, the, the the, the accounts of Henry, Henry VIII's reign and later, um, they are to some extent topographically clear, to some extent they're not. There was a big building, it survived until the late 19th century, I think it's the 1870s, 1880s, and uh, a, a royal engineer uh, called um, Colonel Gordon uh, did a survey of it and basically it was revealed to be falling down, its walls were, were, were bulging. So down it had to come. Um, and it's one of the many buildings where, again, I think, yeah, it'd be really interesting with the benefits of modern archaeology to actually be able to see it because it was probably partly a Tudor structure. It was probably partly a medieval structure. Um, but again, very heavily looked over. It worked over in the 17th and 18th centuries. And its last manifestation was as a military storehouse, as uh, as an armory and, and, and a place where, where munitions and uniforms and other things like, like that were kept. Okay, thank you for that, thank you for that. So we're going to pick up our conversation of Anne Boleyn again for a moment, and particularly this idea of prisoners in the Tower, which 
going back to where we started the conversation, perhaps most people relate the history of the tower and the Tudors to its kind of gruesome history of incarceration. Um, and um, I thought it might be interesting just to talk a little bit about um, the difference between low status prisoners, high status prisoners, and what could they expect in terms yes. of the treatment that was meted out to them? Right, there's enormous gradations about this, and Anne Boleyn is kind of off the scale at the top mm -hmm. end. Um, down at the bottom is pretty grim, but perhaps not quite as grim maybe as some people are imagining. Um, I used to get loads of questions when I was a curator, and I bet the present lot do, of people saying, where are the dungeons? They want to see dungeons. And it's a tricky question because the Tower of London's prison accommodation wasn't quite the way that many people would expect it to be. That your, the, the, the conditions in which you were kept were not entirely dictated by what it was that you were accused of having done. They were much closer to the kind of person that you were. And essentially, if you're rich and you're important, you might end up paying with your life, and many people do, but the days leading up to that are not probably going to be as horrible as you might imagine. You would get one of the, you, you know, you might not even be in, in one of the medieval bits of the Tower of London. Much of the accommodation for prisoners was in buildings that weren't built as, as, as prisons, and many prisoners were kept in the defensive towers around the two circuits of the of the wall, the inner curtain wall and the outer curtain wall, particularly the inner curtain wall. We know about this because when you go into buildings like the, the Beecham Tower or the Martin Tower, you see lots of graffiti. Mm. And that graffiti uh, is, is really interesting. I'm not aware of anyone that's ever done a really detailed study of it. Some of your, your listeners may, may be able to prove me wrong. But Certainly the, the upper floor of the, of the Beecham Tower is absolutely, there's hardly a surface that, that's not covered in graffiti, but it's graffito over graffito. You know, they inter, they, they, they sort of, you know, over, over, overlap one another. Some of them are so fine, you couldn't do them without a certain amount of skill as a stonemason, quite frankly. The idea that someone is just scratching their name with a belt buckle or something else like that, they're, they're, they're much too good for that. They would take a long time to do. They would take a lot of skill. And your warder would surely, if he didn't want you yeah. to do it, would stop you. Quite, so yeah. it's always quite, obviously, me. you know, some of this was 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 the kind of thing that, that actually, you know, people were encouraged to do. And we're talking about the reign of Henry VIII. Some of the earliest surviving graffiti is from Henry VIII's reign. So in the Beecham Tower, Adam Sedborough, the abbot of Gervo Abbey, uh, one of the Cistercian monasteries, Abbot Adam Sedra was, was involved in the Pilgrimage of Grace in 1536 and gets brought to the Tower of London and eventually, I believe, is executed at Tyburn. So, you know, he, Ad, Adam Sedra Abbas Yorival, he, he, he carves his name in Latin on the wall. And there's a lot of graffiti, um, you know, all around the time. These are not dungeons. They're up in the air for a start. They're quite big spaces. They've got latrines. They've got fireplaces and presumably the people that are in some of those those spaces are probably being comparatively well looked after mm. but the distinction that I always think is interesting if you sort of take out the Anne Boleyns of the world who, who to some extent are exceptional was whether you were what was called a close prisoner or whether you were a prisoner with the liberty now a close prisoner is under a very strict regime in which they're locked up pretty much all the time or all the time they are not allowed visitors. They, uh, their privileges are questions like whether they have a fire, whether they have writing materials, whether they're allowed in any way to communicate with people in the outside world. But, you know, that and and being a close prisoner, of course, would be very disorienting. There's one of the graffiti and I can't remember which tower it's in where someone say, gives his name and says close prisoner. 423 days thousands and thousands of you know how, how many mm. hours you know that the whole thing is obviously right. it's just incredibly boring and mm. and awful and you know the, the 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 story of thomas moore there are moments where thomas moore is kept as a close prisoner in order to put the to t tighten the screws on him a bit and his privileges get worse if you have the liberty of the tower of london it's in a way it's a bit like having a house arrest for some people you're allowed to walk in discrete areas of the tower so you can walk on the leads 
and to, to take the air or you can walk in the garden or you just get to walk around in the interior of the Tower of London. And as long as when the bell goes, you're back where you're supposed to be. That's it. Now, I think it was realised, particularly at times of um, of political uncertainty, that this is potentially really dangerous, that people are, you know, that, that, that if, if people are in um, for for uh, for suspicion of, of being against state security, letting them go where they want within the tower and talk to who they want and all that lot is 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 actually a quite quite bad thing. So certainly during the reign of Philip and Mary, there's a there, there's there's lots of um, hand wringing about I think that the prisoner that the privilege of being a close prisoner should be withdrawn. But like for example, Elizabeth, yes, Princess Elizabeth, thinking. when she's in, yeah. she is a uh, she to to some extent has liberty she's mm. allowed to walk in the garden but only under escort so they're very careful about you know no one is allowed to talk to her and all her clothing you know is searched all the time to make sure there's no there's no messages coming and the lieutenant beddingfeld is always being told what to do with elizabeth but she is allowed to, to go for a walk and so famously is robert dudley and there's always the possibility that they may actually have taken exercise together mm. while they prisoners in the Tower of London. And, so, and Anne Boleyn, was she a close prisoner? Yeah, I, well, I think she's allowed to walk a lot within the apartments. What I can't remember is I don't think she's allowed to to, to see other people apart from the officers of the Tower of London. I, 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 I need to mm. check that. I can't really remember. I and I don't think she gets to walk in the garden either. I think mm. she she gets she gets the run of the apartments, which is exercise up to a point, but they're not that huge. It, the yeah. Tower of London is not that huge. Uh, um, a, 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 a fortress. So I know that people have been asking very much about kind of, you know, the, the bones, and, uh, who's okay. buried um, in St. Peter. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that, because obviously we've got a number of high status prisoners, including Anne Berlin, Catherine Howard and so on, buried in the chapel. So Tell us about that story and particularly what happened during the Victorian period. And where are right. we now with who do we know is buried where? OK, the uh, we don't know as much as we'd like to. But OK, a bit of background, first of all. I don't know whether anyone's come out and said that they don't know the Tower of London, but just assuming there's one or two people that don't. The chapel that we're talking about is the Chapel of St. Peter Ad Vincula, which is the, the parish church of the Tower of London. It stands at the northwest corner of the inner ward um, and it's a building of the Tudor period it's actually it's, it's it's a very beautiful building I love it dearly and it's the place where people who were executed either like Anne and Catherine Howard inside the Tower of London or on Tower Hill would be brought back uh, and buried and the most there, there are the, the 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 information about their burials is by and large not good. It tends to be chroniclers that are writing about it. So always there's the question of did they really know? But anyway, it's all clear enough that the high ranking prisoners like Anne and Catherine and later on, like the Earl of Essex or like George Lord Rochford or like the Countess of Salisbury, they get buried very close to the high altar up the East End. The because the chapel was the parish church, it keeps being altered and you and and updated to some extent until by the time you get to the to the to the second half of the 19th century it was a bit of a scandal because it didn't really look like a Tudor chapel anymore and the 19th century is a time when tourism and an interest in history is is, is kicking off for a complicated number of reasons that I could get into so people are coming to the tower in increased numbers and are fairly appalled at this nasty interior with box pews and with galleries around all sides and as the historian Macaulay said you know this place looks like the meeting house in a provincial market town it's not good enough it should look better than that because the historical significance of the people that are buried in the chapel is too great cut to the 1870s when as well as people complaining about what it looked like the building was in dire straits and particularly the pavements were collapsing and they were collapsing because of intercutting burials underneath and, and now I have on my table uh, one of my prized possessions, a book that's published by Doyne C. Bell, who is the secretary of the Privy Purse to Queen Victoria. And Doyne C. Bell, the book is called The Chapels in the Tower of London. I bought it in a secondhand bookshop years and years ago. It's got the minutes of the meetings in which they decided what they were going to do and dug up the bones. 
And the critical day is the 9th of November 1876, when a number of great and good, including a surgeon, a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons called Dr. Frederick J. Muat, and Doyne C. Bell himself and the authorities of the Tower of London met at half past 12 just after noon in the chapel, decided they were going to dig the floor up, dug the floor up, and they'd finished by half by quarter past three. So this is not an archaeological no. um, process by any means. They must have gone at it like a bullet a gate. <laughs> and in as much as we know anything about what lies under that pavement, it's what Doctor, it's what Doyne C. Bell and Frederick J. Muat wrote. They knew where they were going to look for certain people. So Anne Boleyn was, they, they figured she's one of the old, the, the, the first ones who's buried with George George Rochford and figured that they would be buried on the north side. And on the 9th of uh, November, they went down two feet and found a pile of bones. It wasn't a, a discreet burial because other later burials had come along and dealt with it. But, I'm going to love this, mm. um, they describe, and I have to read this out, okay. at this depth, the bones of a female were found not lying in the original order, but which had evidently for some reason or other been heaped together into smaller space. All these bones were examined by Dr. Muat, who at once pronounced them to be those of a female of between 25 and 30 years of age, a delicate frame of body who had been slender and perfect proportions. The forehead and lower jaw were small, especially well formed. Notice at no point does he ever say, and between the third and fourth cervical vertebra, signs that are very sharp implemented because it wasn't a, a, a whole burial. It was, right, it, yeah. it, was just, it was just bits. Then I, 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 I'm omitting a bit. And then it says, not much doubt existed in the minds of those present that these were the remains of Anne Boleyn. Well, there you go. I mean, you know, they believe what they what they wanted to believe. Mm. Now, Frederick Muat, he does have more description of the people. And I can just read a little bit because you may enjoy it. The bones of the head indicate a well-formed round skull with an intellectual forehead, straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face, rather square, full chin. The remains of the vertebra, the bones of the lower limbs indicate a well-formed woman of middle height with a short and slender neck. The ribs show depth and roundness of chest. The hand and feet bones indicate delicate and well-shaped hands and feet with tapering fingers and a narrow foot. The hands I will just come back to in a minute. They are all consistent, as he says, with the published descriptions of the Queen and the bones of the skull might well belong to the person portrayed in the painting by Holbein in the collection of the Earl of Warwick. So they really wanted to believe this. Yeah. Now, Muat was there because Queen Victoria wished him to be there. Queen Victoria had said, yes, you can dig up the floor, but I am appalled at the sound of what you're telling me, that burials of important and royal people had been disturbed. I demand that, first of all, they be treated with respect, what will happen to them in the long term, and that every opportunity to use medical science as it exists at the moment to identify the people should be taken advantage of. Um, you will in, you'll love this to do with the hands, and this is the story of the supernumerary finger, uh -huh. where um, Doyne C. Bell, in a footnote, um, quotes... Uh, Wyatt's life and says there was found indeed upon the side of her nail upon one of her fingers some little show of a nail which yet was so small by the report of those that have seen her as the workmaster seemed to leave it an occasion of greater grace of the hand which with the tip of her other might well be and usually was hidden without any less blemish to it and then Muat says it was at first thought that this malformation could be traced on one of the finger bones but a more careful examination dissipated that impression. Oh. So it was a bit of soil. Um, <laughs> for a moment, they thought that that's what they found. So not quite here right. it is. He's, not... And he lists all of this kind of stuff. Oh, um, I mean, yeah. rather scarily, yeah. there's a lot of reference to intercutting of burials. Rather scarily, they failed to find any bones at all of Catherine Howard. Now, conspiracy theorists might have some fun with this. What? Doyne C. Bell thought was that Catherine Howard being a relatively young lady, her bones just weren't robust enough and they would have completely decayed in the, the ground, which sounds a little unlikely to yeah. me. Yeah, they were just to leave the... absolutely nothing sounds... Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the, mm. there are others that continue to be buried there through the 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, including officers at the Tower of London right up until the middle of the 19th century. So, you know, it's not surprising that it was all a bit of a terrible mess. When you go now, what you see there is a Victorian pavement and it has two rows of heraldic insignia incorporated into its design 
and the names of people. So for, for, for better or for worse, we have what we think are the positions of. I think it's um, or I, th I think it's yes, 12, 12 individuals, wow, okay. including Anne Boleyn and George Lord Richard mm -hmm. and various others. We're never going to know. Mm -hmm. And what we do know is that in accordance with Queen Victoria's wishes, the bones were put into lead coffins, put back in the ground in their approximate positions where they'd been found, and then concrete was poured over the top of them. Oh, so wow. it's so so which is actually something I'd only realised for the first time reading it again today. It's very really interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize, um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, no point in trying to so, look look I mean, looking at this one again. Yeah, Cynthia actually said I've gone back in t in the chat. So Cynthia, you said, do you think the DNA of the bones will eventually be permitted to be investigated? But I think you've just answered that question well, for us. Don't go there. Um I, you know, I, I, I don't know whether historical analysis has changed its views about it. We did used to get asked this and we used to get asked this quite a lot, particularly also to do with the bones purporting to be those of the prince in the tower, which, by the way, are not in our gift anyway. I mean, they are in Westminster Abbey. Mm. You know, DNA analysis is a is very tricky thing. And, you know, these bones, the, the, this is not scientific conditions. The bones um, have been you know, all over the show. They've been handled by, 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 by a lot of people. So. I don't know. I, you know, it's 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 the, the the science gets better as the as the experience of, of Richard the Third in the in the Leicester car park has shown. But um, I, you know, ultimately, I, I I you know, there's a part of me as historian that would like to know, but there's another part of me that actually would would rather just leave them where they are. But, uh, well, we, can you believe it? We are four minutes to the hour. No! Wow. <laughs> Sorry, I talked too much. But, uh... well, there is so much to cover. We could have talked about so many other different things. Um, I do, although two people did ask, so I'm just going to ask for your opinion. Who did kill the princes in the tower? Richard III. Next. But, uh... Okay. <laughs> there you I don't know, first. but he had first crack at it. He had every reason for them to die, as far as I can tell. So. Okay. So, for the couple of people who wanted to know, we have... Uh, Jeremy's thoughts on that. So okay, yeah, one last thought. If he hadn't yeah. killed them, Henry Henry the Seventh doubtless would have done. But right. I don't think Henry the Seventh got the chance. It's, oh. uh... Okay, thank you. So, so well, I think I've been. Hopefully, I've answered many or pulled across many of the questions that people have been asking. <clears throat> if I didn't manage to ask your questions, my sincere apologies. Time always just flies through when we do these live chats. But um, I just wanted to thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much for coming on to Tutor Talk today and to sharing all your passion and knowledge for the tower with us. Well, look, thank you so much, Sarah, for asking me. And thanks for everyone. And, uh, you know, to indulge me going down memory lane. As I say, it's a place uh, where I haven't worked for a long time, but I, 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 it still has a really strong place in my factions. And, you know, but we all think that it, it's so iconic that it'll be with us with us forever. Actually, I've really missed it, and you know, I look forward to the. To, I mean, it's it's open again now now to visitors, and I would strongly, you know, commend everyone to do what I shall do. The first possible opportunity is to go back and have another nose around because it really does yeah. deserve it. And it does deserve it. And as you were pointing out, the heritage sector has had quite a tough time. Um, so the more we can all support these historic sites at the moment, I know it's not possible for everyone, but the more we can the better because they need our support at the moment so thank you for that jeremy and um all i'm going to do now is i just want to close up with a few words to folks so thank you so much for joining us so guys um yeah i just a couple of minutes just to say a couple of things first of all thank you so much for coming on to the live chat today it's been great to see old friends and also to see some new people joining. So that's been brilliant. Thank you so much. So Robin, I'll be listening again to this. I thought I knew so much, but there's always more to learn. Isn't that the case? Believe me, yes. And uh, Gillian, a big thank you to Jeremy and Sarah for a wonderful Saturday afternoon. So very interesting, such a beautiful place to visit. That's fantastic. And Stan, you're asking me, have you got plans to invite Simon Thurley to cover more on Tudor architecture? Simon Thurley is one of my um, heroes. I would love to have Simon Thurley on Tudor Talk. So I might have to keep working on that one. He's very, very busy though, so not easy to get hold of. Um, so I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, if you are not aware, I have a podcast called The Tudor Travel Show. 
first of all, um, Jeremy and I, as you heard me mention, did a podcast about Eltham uh, back in, uh, uh, well, it was recorded in February. I think it was released around May time. So if you want to hear more of Jeremy talking about another English heritage property, then do go to the Tudor Travel Show. So it's on Podbean, it's on Apple Music, it's on Spotify, iTunes, etc. Just ch search the Tudor Travel Show and you'll be able to find uh, Jeremy's episode if you scroll back through older episodes. And But this month I also wanted to give a big shout out to a very special month. I'm doing a whole Mary Queen of Scots month this month. So if you've been following me on social media, you'll know I've been gallivanting around Scotland in the footsteps of Mary Queen of Scots, doing lots of podcast recordings at some magnificent historic sites like Linlithgow and Stirling Pass Castle and Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood. Um, and so I will be posting a podcast unusually once a week rather than once a month through September. So I hope you're going to join me on my travels. The first show went live today. So if you head on over to um, it's the Tudor Travel Show dot com on any of those channels I mentioned, then you'll be able to see it right up there at the front. And then I think the final thing to say is I am back next month. So we do one of these live chats a month with a special guest. And next month it's Jonathan Foyle. Uh, Jonathan is another favorite of mine. Many of you will know that I got involved in um, the uh, discovery of the Anne of Cleves heraldic panels. John Jonathan um, came on board as part of that team and so, um, yeah, um, I've known Jonathan for a little while and he's going to be talking about the marriage bed of um, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. So that will be fantastic and fascinating. What an incredible artifact that is. So it's the first Saturday of October. I hope that I will see you then. Of course, make sure you look out for um, postings on social media to tell you that the uh, talk is coming up. And if you're not already on my mailing list, then you can um, sign up via my blog at thetudortravelguide.com. And there will be some lovely freebies if you sign up as well. So, yeah, I think that's it, folks. Have a lovely evening, afternoon, morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. And I look forward to seeing you on the road, virtually or otherwise. OK, take care. Bye for now.